During the course of this presentation, we'll cover periodic engine and chassis maintenance, engine removal, engine overhaul, and component reconditioning, and engine assembly. We'll also cover carburetor service, electrical systems operation and troubleshooting, and we'll finish up with fork rebuilding. Since a substantial amount of flywheel effect is desirable on any large displacement touring bike, the factory's decision to equip this model with a permanent magnet type alternator provided two advantages. Firstly, this type of system utilizes a heavy rotor, providing that additional flywheel effect, and in comparison to the electromagnetic type, it's a relatively simple system to troubleshoot. The main components of the system are the rotor, the three-phase stator, the combination rectifier regulator, and of course, the battery. Before we cover the various tests you'd perform during troubleshooting, let's review some basics. Fixed to this rotor are four magnets, each of course possessing a north and south pole. The magnetic flux field, or lines of magnetic force, exist between these poles. As the rotor turns, these flux lines cut through the stator windings, and current is produced. AC, or alternating current, to be more precise. This AC current then passes through a rectifier and is converted to DC, or direct current. From there, current flows to the battery and is available to power the various electrical components. The faster this rotor turns, the more current is generated. And since the magnetic field produced by these magnets can't be varied like that of a system using a field coil or electromagnet, the voltage in the system must be controlled by bleeding excess current to ground. In this system, that's precisely what happens. Voltage levels in the electrical system are monitored by the voltage regulator, and if the voltage exceeds 14.5, the excess is routed to ground. When a customer rolls his machine into your shop and the battery's dead, what's the first item you check? Would you dig right in and start troubleshooting the charging system? I hope not, because more often than not, it's the battery itself that needs attention, not the charge system. Although this system doesn't need a fully charged battery to operate, others do. In any case, you should always verify battery condition first. Visually check the condition of the case. If it's cracked, obviously it needs replacing. Check the fluid level and specific gravity. Once you're sure the battery is not at fault, connect a voltmeter set to the 20 volt DC scale across the battery. Start the engine and bring the revs up to around 2500 to 3000 RPM. If the system is in proper working order, it should produce a reading of 14 to 15 volts. If it doesn't, start troubleshooting by checking the resistance of the stator coils. Remember, they must be tested cold and at operating temperature. Because this is a three-phase generator, there are three circuits that must be checked. Connect one ohmmeter lead to the center white wire and the other to either of the remaining two. What in fact we're measuring here is the total resistance of two windings. Next, switch the meter leads and check the second circuit and the third. Resistance for each circuit should measure 0.42 ohms plus or minus 15%. Finally, we want to be sure that none of these windings are shorted to ground. Connect one meter lead to ground and with your meter still set to the ohms times one scale, check each winding individually your meter should indicate infinite resistance, or what would normally be termed an open circuit. Checking the rectifier is no more difficult than the stator. But here, because we're checking continuity in two directions, the placement of the positive and negative leads is important. If we look at the diagram, you can see there are six diodes contained in this circuit. Simply stated, a diode is a one-way electrical valve. Current will flow in one direction, but not in the other. 
So if you connect your own meter in one direction, it should indicate continuity or zero resistance. When you switch the lead, it should indicate infinite resistance. Your service manual contains a detailed circuit diagram and a chart listing the proper method of connection and the appropriate readings for checking each individual diode. Because there are two checks to be performed on each diode, there are a total of 12 test procedures in all. The voltage regulator circuits are contained along with the rectifier in the single package. The voltage regulator can't be checked using readily available test equipment. So if all the other components in the system are in good working condition, you'll have to assume that the regulator itself is at fault. One final note in regard to the Venture charging system. An update modification designed to lower the operating temperature of the stator coils has been introduced by the factory. This replacement rotor securing bolt is equipped with a small oil passage hole that will allow engine oil to circulate over the windings. The cooling effect afforded by the oil will lower the coil temperature and extend the service life of the stator. This new style bolt is available through your regional parts department under part number 90105-12318. Any unit still equipped with the original bolt should be refitted with this new part. Next, we'll take a look at the electrical portion of the cooling system, its operation, and some troubleshooting procedures you may find helpful. The cooling system electricals can be divided into two separate sections. The fan control circuit consisting of the fan, the fan relay switch, and the thermostatic switch, and the temperature gauge circuit consisting of the gauge and a thermo switch. The fan circuit works like this. As the coolant temperature reaches about 105 degrees centigrade or 220 degrees Fahrenheit, the thermostatic switch closes. Current then flows through the relay causing the relay switch to close, completing the fan circuit. The thermostatic switch will remain closed and the fan will continue to run until the coolant temperature has been reduced to 98 degrees centigrade or about 208 degrees Fahrenheit. The switch will then open and the fan will shut off. Obviously, if any one of these components, the fan motor, the relay switch, or the thermostatic switch fail, the system will not function. So where do we start troubleshooting? Well, if overheating is evident and the fan has not come on, it may be the thermostatic switch. Simply bypass it. With the ignition switch on, disconnect the blue-green wire from the switch and touch it to ground. If the fan operates, you already know both the fan motor and the relay are OK. If it doesn't, check for current in the system. Your voltage reading here should be equal to battery voltage. If current is not reaching this point, either the fuse is blown, in which case the ignition system will also be inoperative, or you've got a poor connection or a broken wire. To check the relay, you'll need a 12-volt battery and your ohm meter. First, check the resistance of the relay coil by connecting one ohm meter lead to the blue-green wire and the other to the red-white wire. Resistance here should be 100 ohms plus or minus 10%. If the coil resistance is within spec, proceed with the next check. Connect your 12-volt battery, one lead to the red-white wire and the other to the blue-green wire. At this point, the relay switch should close. Now, connect your ohm meter to the other red-white lead and the blue fan lead. The meter should read zero resistance. When the battery is disconnected, the relay switch should open, and your ohm meter reading should indicate an open circuit or infinite resistance. Checking the fan motor is a simple matter of connecting a 12-volt battery directly to the motor leads. If the fan operates smoothly and with no abnormal vibration, it can be considered in good condition. The temperature gauge circuit is really quite simple. There are only two components, the gauge itself and a thermoswitch. 
Now, the operation of this switch differs from that of the fan switch. As we've seen, the fan switch is designed to close at a specified temperature, and open, in this case, at a lower but still specific temperature. This switch is designed in such a way that as heat is applied, its ability to conduct current increases. So as the coolant temperature increases, more current is allowed to flow through the switch to ground. The temperature gauge simply monitors the flow and translates it into a meter reading. Your first troubleshooting step, if you're not getting a meter reading, would be the same as that of the fan circuit, bypass the switch. Turn the ignition switch on, remove the wire from the thermo switch, and momentarily touch it to ground. The needle should move full scale from cold to hot. Touch the lead to ground just long enough to see that the meter needle does swing. Shorting the wire to ground for any extended period of time can damage the gauge. If the needle doesn't move, check the circuit for poor connections. And if everything's OK there, replace the gauge. Now, both the thermostatic fan switch and the temperature gauge thermo switch can be checked by attaching your own meter, one lead to the connector, the other to the housing, and submerging the tip in water. Heat the water and monitor the temperature. Your service manual gives you the required ohm meter readings at specified temperature levels. One last point about the placement of these two pieces in the cooling system. Since this housing is positioned high in the system, it's important that the coolant level be properly maintained. If the coolant level falls below this point, neither of these units will function because there'll be no coolant in the housing. There'll be no temp gauge reading and the fan will not come on even if the engine overheats.